Yes, so uh, it's very important um, during the process of, of resolving conflict in our life that we weigh our hearts, which is something we should always be doing all the time anyways. You know, always check to see if you're in a place of growth, if you're in a place of listening. You don't want to be like the foolish person of Proverbs. You want to be like the wise person of Proverbs. So it's one of those things we have to constantly weigh your heart, constantly be willing to change, that kind of stuff, uh, which gets harder, especially when you get kids, because you feel like um, if you back down, you know, somehow it's going to make you look like a fool in front of your kids. Um, but the opposite is true. When you're willing to acknowledge you were wrong, it actually makes you look better to your kids. Um, so obviously when we're dealing with conflict, we want to say, okay, am I dealing with this right? Not, not am I doing the right things, but am I dealing with this right? How is my heart in this conflict? Is this where I actually care about them? Because it's easy to just do something, but it's harder to do something from your heart. Right? Like, here's a good example. Going to church. It's easy to give up an hour or two, or if you're in some churches, three hours <laughs> for a Sunday service. That's, you know, that's somewhat easy, but it's harder to go um, and, and really allow yourself to have an encounter with God, to really open yourself to what God wants to do. So when you're, when you're, correcting, when you're correct, uh, correcting someone or someone's correcting you, it's a very important that you don't let a certain attitude um, arise. And that attitude is a I told you so attitude. You, you, know, you don't want to let this get going, okay? Um, if somebody got in, in a pickle, and even if you knew better, even if you tried to warn them, don't resort to this kind of an attitude. Um, it's, and sometimes we say, well, I didn't say I told you so, but we were thinking it so loudly <laughs> that it was very, very obvious uh, what, we were, what we were getting at. And uh, people can definitely see and they pick up on our, on our attitudes. Um, uh, here, a good example is uh, go and do home visits, right? Uh, go visit somebody who is not able to get out. And be in a hurry the whole time. You don't have to say anything. They know that you are real antsy to get out of there. Um, so, so it's not just about doing the right things. It's about doing it with the right heart and the right attitude. And if you look at, once again, I'll remind you, that we looked at the context of Matthew 18. It talks about the lost sheep and how Jesus wasn't talking about the lost sheep being somebody in the world, but somebody in the church that had gone astray. And then he goes to the example of the, um, right after Matthew 18, 15, he goes and talks about uh, the landlord who had a servant that was forgiven a lot, but was unwilling to forgive other servant. And that kind of shows us the attitude that we're supposed to have in resolving these conflicts. It's not just about doing the right things. It's not just about going to church. It's not just about reading your Bible. It's about your attitude. Are you listening to the Bible? Are you willing to change? Are you willing to let your heart be softened? And if you look at the mission of this church, the, the core of this church's existence, why we are here, love God, love people, but it doesn't stop there. It says, serve both well. We're not just loving, we're trying to do it well. And uh, it's easy uh, to, to kind of resort to, resort to the idea of, well, I'm being faithful in the things. But it doesn't matter how faithful you are in the things if your heart isn't right. It's like when for, we looked at 1 Corinthians, uh, I think it was a week or two ago, and I was talking about that if you have full knowledge, if you, can, if, you, if, you ha if you understand all mysteries, if you speak in the tongues of angels or of men, but you don't have love, it doesn't really count for much of anything. So how much more so if we're trying to bring resolution to a conflict in our lives and we don't have love? It just doesn't really amount to anything. And sometimes we do it in a way that's very conniving and we know what we're doing, but we pretend like we don't know what we're doing where there's a conflict and where, oh, I'm trying to make it better, but we don't, we don't really want it to get better. We just want to say, I did all the right things, but our heart isn't really in forgiving the person or in bringing restoration. So Philippians 2, I'm sorry, Philippians 4, 2 through 7 says, I urge Judea and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers. So but let's stop right there. This one, I kind of set up what's going on. Paul has written this, this whole letter to this church in a city called Philippi. And here he's getting towards the end of it, the last couple of things he wants to say. And he goes out of his way because there's these two women who just aren't getting along. But they were actually people who were sharing the gospel, working alongside Paul, and they just weren't able uh, to get along. So then we pick up uh, in the next slide there, uh, Shane. 
uh, uh, Melissa, would you mind reading that? Okay, thank you. So one thing we do is whenever we're reading these verses, we just kind of forget everything that we read before. It. Just so, hey, uh, what is this there? Rejoice, let your graciousness be known to everyone. Hey, great. Well, what was right before that? He was talking about these two people who were in conflict with each other, and he was wanting them to fix it. And then he goes on to say, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. So he's saying, resolve your conflicts. And now he's saying some things that we are, this is not divorced. If he wanted um, the whole Judea and Syntyche getting along thing to be apart from everything else, he would have stuck it at the very end, like he did in Romans. But he stuck it right in the middle of this to kind of get the point across. You're getting along. You're rejoicing. This is, we're keeping our eyes on, on what's actually important. We're letting our graciousness be known because the Lord is near. He's, he's with us. He's seeing us. When we, when we fight, we are subjecting the Lord to that too. We are, we are in, a way, in a sense, crucifying, the Lord, crucifying Jesus as we fight amongst ourselves. Something that he's kind of trying to tie it all together. And then he, bring, and then he says this, But in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So you guys are, get, you guys are not getting along. What well, we've tried, we can't. We just can't make it work. Present your, requir- your, your, your request to God. So he's trying to tell them how to, fix their, how to fix their issue here. Now, it applies to other things in our lives, but the context is very obvious. These verses have to do with these two women who can't stop fighting. So this says a lot of stuff about conflict. Whenever you're done with conflict, pray about it. Uh, working to be of the same mind. You know, a lot of times... We as Christians like to go in our own direction. Okay, we don't really want to be of the same mind, working on the same task, you know. We are here for the community. We all want to be here for a little bit of our own self. I'm here for this. I'm here for this. I care about this, but I don't really care about that. I care about this over here. And uh, here in in Philippians, he tells us, no, 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 no. That's why you guys are having fights, because you all have different reasons for being here. Be of the same mind. We're here for for Christ. That's what we're here for. And um, most church conflict, I will say this, uh, I'm absolutely convinced of this, most church conflict, conflict is, I'm not getting my way. I'm telling you, 9 out of 10, more than, some are more than 9 out of 10 times, but less than 10 out of 10, like 9.9 out of 10 times, I guess. It's, you're just not getting your way. And you want to get your way. And so rather than just getting over it, we turn it into a mountain. That's 99% of the time, that's exactly what it is. It's, we always have like these, these cleverly devised arguments for why it's okay for us to be in this, in this conflict with other people. But it's very simple. You're not getting your way and you want to get your way. That, that's it. Like don't, don't sugarcoat it. Get over yourself. And I, I say that as somebody who has struggled with bad attitudes a long time. I know what I'm talking about, about struggling with bad attitudes. It's easy to justify it. But that's not what Philippians is telling us to do. You have to work to be of the same mind. I'm not naturally going to be of the same mind. You're not naturally going to be of the same mind. We're going to be naturally at odds. We have to work to work together. So, if it comes down to it, just bend. It's not about you getting your way. Just bend. Well, they're not doing it the right way. Well, I understand. Bend. So there's two questions, or I guess before I get there, I'll, I missed a line. So what if they don't change? What if you're trying to resolve conflict with somebody, you're trying to get them restored back into the church, you're trying to forgive them, you're trying to move forward, but they just won't change? You did all the right things, they won't change. You tried to talk one-on-one, they still just won't change. Well, what do you do 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 then? What is the point of it? Why did I even try? And here's the thing, okay? You do what's right not so that they will change. You don't do what's right just so that somebody else will change. Okay, you don't do that. You parent right, not so that your kids will do, do what you want. You parent right because that's the right thing to do. You treat your spouse this way, not so that they'll do what you want them to do or listen to you or whatever. You do it because that's the right thing to do. You act this way in a church, not because you'll get something out of it, because it's the right thing to do. You, you, you don't do the right thing just so that you can, you know, basically get the cracker. You do what's right because it's right. Now, that's, that, that's easy to say, and, and I know what all of you guys are thinking. Of course, obviously, duh. But eventually, there's going to be a situation 
Or are you going to say something like this? I work so hard, and I see nothing for my efforts. Why did I even try? Or are you going to say something like this? I really thought they were going to change. I really thought that we're going to be friends from this. I did everything right. You're going to say something along the lines of that. And this is the thing I want, I want you to get from that. Even if it doesn't work how you wanted it to, or they didn't change, or whatever, you do what's right because it's right. So there's two questions that you always have to ask yourself to maintain a proper perspective when you're dealing with conflict, um, whatever the conflict is. The first question, how does God treat you? This is what we lose sight of all the time. In every church conflict, nobody asks this question, ever. That's why there's a church conflict, because we think we're better than the other person, or we think that you know we're just annoyed by the other person, or whatever it might be. We don't ever ask the question, but how does God treat me? I don't like this person, they're a pain in the butt, yeah, 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 but how does God treat you? Because what happens is we see the, the best in ourselves and the worst in everybody else. That's just how we are. If we, when we get in, in fights with, with our spouse, I'm right, they're wrong, because I know what's in my head and I don't know what's in theirs, right? When we have our kids, right? Okay, so my kids are obviously wrong because I'm the parent, because I could never make a mistake as the parent. You see what I'm getting at here? How does God treat you? Well, he's very patient with you. I've been to, very, and I've been to some churches where the instant that there's somebody who, um, well, is a sinner, comes in the door, there, there's like this barrage, this attack on them. Homosexuals shouldn't be allowed in our church, or, you know, transgenders. And, where else would they go? Like, they, they're here because the same reason us hypocrites are here. We need Jesus. Like, we're all in the same boat. None of us are, are better sinners than another person. We're saved by grace, not by our goodness or our works or by how awesome we are. And uh, so that's exactly where we should be. So how does God treat us? He treats us like a sinner who he wants to come home. See what I mean? And, and when we don't take that attitude to how we do with other people, we miss God's heart. We don't get it. And I totally get this because, I mean, like, like I say, um, I'm going to a, fam a very stressful family thing this, week, this weekend. And obviously, my mom's funeral is already going to be stressful. But there's a whole bunch of people who like family drama that are going to be there. And I have to have a good attitude even though I don't, I don't feel it in here at all. I just, <laughs> I want to give them a piece of my mind. That's what I want. And uh, I don't really care how God is treating me in this situation. I want to get back at them. Does that make sense? That's the struggle of life. But you always have to stop and ask yourself, how does God treat me? He's patient with me. He forgives me. He wants me to do better. He doesn't want me to fail. Then the second question, how does he view them? How does God view them? So I know how I view them. Oh, they're just a pain. But how does God view them? Well, I think that he views them much the same way he views me. And see, in our mind, once again, this is a little bit foreign because I'm in an elevated position, and because I don't like them, they're in a, in a, in a lower position. And God, on the other hand, kind of views us all the exact same as people who need grace. Like, he, he loves us all equally. And uh, that, that's something difficult, dif definitely difficult. As far as resolving conflict itself, there are two ways to resolve conflict. Everybody focuses on one or the other. Very few do we focus on both. Uh, the first way is the easiest way, remove the troublemaker. Ta-da! I mean, <laughs> uh, sometimes we just, we can't see the forest for the trees. If you remove the troublemaker, the whole situation just dies down. Look at Proverbs 26, uh, 20 through 21. It says, without wood, fire goes out. Without a gossip, conflict dies down. As charcoal for embers and wood for fire, so is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. They're going to find each other. The problems in that person, they're going to find each other. Conflict in that person, they're going to find each other. Just They're going to find their way to each other. So the first obvious way is to remove the troublemaker. Now, and sometimes in church, we kind of go, to, go too far to one side, right? 
So we believe in peace and, and, and grace and, and all that stuff. But here's the thing. Sometimes to have peace, you have to have war. It's hard. It's hard because we think, hey, Jesus, we have to have the way of peace. But it's impossible to have peace without war in some situations, right? I mean, think about this. How is Jesus, Jesus going to resolve the issue of sin and antagonism against him in the end? He's going to kill his enemies, right? He's going he's to kill them. That's what the Bible says, right? So he's going to have war, and then after that war, what's going to happen? Peace. So sometimes the unfortunate reality is that there's someone who's just causing problems that has to be dealt with. I want to be a loving church. Yeah, we all want to be a loving church, but you can't be a loving church if there's someone there that has their heart set on destroying the church. I can't get behind the, the pastor's vision. I can't get behind this. I'd rather sit and talk bad, and I'd rather see how many people also feel the exact same as me. The pastor, he's this. The worship leader, she's that. The youth pastor, he's this. All that you're doing is causing a bigger problem, and you cannot possibly convince yourself, I love God while you are tearing apart his church. That's just impossible. You're saying, I love the body while you're tearing apart the... the I love the head while you're tearing apart the body. It's just impossible. Try loving your wife while you kill her body. It's not going to happen. Like, it's just impossible. So, the second way is to help the troubled person. Um, Now, I do want to say, we live in what's called a welfare society. It's not the best option, usually, to just go around handing out money. So be careful with that. But there, and somewhere along the way, we, we equated handing out money to helping people. And there's just a lot more ways to help people than just throwing around money. I'm not saying you should never give money. I'm just saying be, be careful because sometimes it's not really helping. Um, there was uh, numerous situations where a parent felt really bad for their kid because they had gotten themselves in a bad situation. And so they started giving them money, which basically just can, what that equated to was they took the money, bought drugs, they were in a bad situation, so they went back to their parents who gave them more money. You see what I'm saying? It's just this never-ending cycle and it wasn't really helping. So helping doesn't mean just simply I'm throwing money at the problem. It means actually helping. And you know, the funny thing is oftentimes helping, and I know this, this isn't the Christian answer, but this is, this is so true. A lot of times helping is just listening. Nine out of ten times when people come to you for counseling, they don't even want you to say anything. They just has, have never been listened to for at least or at least haven't been listened to for a long time and they just want somebody to hear that's it and then they figure it out on their own and they just kind of you know they say a couple of stupid things and then a couple of weeks later they're they've gotten better and they are months sometimes and then they go on their way not all the time but a lot of the time uh, galatians 6 2 says carry one another's burdens in this way you will fulfill the law of christ so I said this before, and I, and I still stick with it. I, I know not everybody agreed with me when I said it the first time, but it, it, I, I'm more convinced now than when I said it the first time. Nobody likes dealing with conflict. Nobody. There are some people who like causing conflict and drama. Yes, I, w- I will say that. I've got some people who I'm going to go see tomorrow who are like that, or I guess not tomorrow, Saturday, who are like that. I totally understand. There, there are those people. But nobody really likes um, nobody really likes dealing with conflict. What I mean, what I mean by dealing with it is is resolving it, not brushing it under the rug. Healing, forgiving, that kind of stuff, not 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 causing it, fixing it. And the reason is because it's draining. It's very draining to deal with conflict. Uh, but sometimes you don't have a choice. Uh, there was this woman who was uh, doing this uh, doing this ministry. Um, and she kept trying to take over other people's ministries over and over and over again. And uh, she was a very negative person. She was always complaining about stuff. And there were two ways that we could have dealt with it. Number one, just ignore it. Trying to keep the peace because I don't want to deal with the conflict, which is true. I don't want to deal with the conflict. Just kind of, you know, back off and it'll run its course. Well, yes, you should be patient with people and give grace, but... That really wasn't working. It was get, making it where it was rubbing off on other people. People were stepping down from ministries. It had to be dealt with. And uh, so here's the thing. 
it was dealt with in a very respectful way. I don't really want to get into it, but it was done very respectfully. And um, they didn't want to continue coming if they couldn't run other people's ministries. That's really what it came down to. And so they left, and the situation was resolved. The whole atmosphere changed. There was a food pantry. The workers weren't griping and complaining. Everyone was having a good time. The people who left, left felt encouraged. Uh, you know, I mean, from the food pantry. As they'd get their food, they left feeling encouraged. Uh, the other ministries started doing better. We started seeing more people coming. See, when you tolerate somebody who's not the right person for the job, it ensures that the right people won't step up. It ensures that you will get more of what you tolerate bad volunteers. And so what we do is we say, well, they're volunteering. Not everybody should be volunteering <laughs> or should be allowed to volunteer. Um, either way, have you want to look at that. Um, so an- another way of, g- of, of kind of giving this example to, to help you figure out what I'm saying is um, refugees, right? Y- you can help refugees by, like, supporting them, like, you know, giving them money and that kind of stuff, which would translate to food and shelter. Uh, or you can remove whatever is causing them to be a refugee. There's two ways to help a refugee, right? You can give them the stuff that they need to survive, or you can remove whatever is causing them to be a refugee. That makes sense, right? You guys are looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. There are two ways <laughs> to fix a refugee problem. <clears throat> so nowadays, though, we live, in a, we live in a culture that has this idea that this kind of whole don't judge me culture. Like, I can do whatever, and you just stay out of it, you know, Um, which is a very destructive thing. And what we do is if somebody tries to correct us, we say, oh, you're toxic, when the the problem is that I have a toxic attitude in me, and I'm not willing to address it, which is toxic. Yeah, I'm poisoning myself by not allowing myself to be changed. Um, and, And it really is hard to get help without judging, Imagine what would happen if somebody needed help because they were depressed, but they couldn't judge and discern, I'm depressed. And nobody around them could judge and discern that they were depressed. And even if they did go into counseling, the counselor never once was able to discern and judge, this person is depressed. They would never get the help that they need. See, judgment isn't a bad thing. What's a bad thing is being a judgmental person. Someone who's always negative and tearing people down. But judgment is a good thing. Um, and not just in the sense of like God's divine wrath judgment, but also judgment in the sense of uh, discernment. As Christians, we're actually in covenant with one another. Which with, What that translates to is that we are responsible for one another. We are responsible to one another. If I, as your pastor, have an affair, for instance, it is your responsibility... First off, to remove me from the position. Your responsibility to do that. You don't brush that into the... It's your responsibility to do that. Second off, it's your responsibility to try and get me the help that I need to heal my marriage. We are indebted to one another. We are the body of Christ. We're supposed to be... We're responsible to one another. We're supposed to be there for each other. And we're not supposed to just brush us under the rug. God hates sin. It's completely against his character. We have to address it. Um, the problem is, is that we don't, when we do um, correct, we don't really do it to encourage one another. And uh, we make, we try to correct people on things that don't really matter. Um, I had told the story before, and I'll tell it again, uh, about how I was at this church. And issue number one was there was this guy that came in with a hat on. That was issue number one. Even though there was a whole gossip ring where there was a bunch of people talking bad about other people in the church, calling themselves Christians, a gossip ring, that was totally fine. But that guy who came, on, came in with a hat, ooh, string him up. Which, this isn't on my notes, but I just got to say this. That doesn't really make sense because the priests of the Old Testament, they wore head coverings when they went into the Holy of Holies. Did you know that? You're saying that we now have more restrictions than they did in the Old Testament law? That doesn't make sense, like at all. Uh, we are the temple in here. We are the temple. It just, it just doesn't really make sense to make a big deal out of that. But 
you know, whatever. To each his own. So what happens when you can't resolve a conflict? Wait until you can. I tried to fix this. I tried to, I tried to, you know, I tried to heal. It just wouldn't work. Okay, wait until you can. What we do is we try once, then we let it go for forever. <laughs> Maybe you do need to step back from it, yeah, but that doesn't mean just leave it, leave it for forever. And there is one last thing we need to talk about, and that's this. A sign of a bad attitude when somebody says, you need to tell it like it is. This is how you know you have a bad attitude when you say stuff like this. You just tell it like it is. Because this is what, you, what people really mean when they say that. You need to loudly and repeatedly denounce the four sins that really bother you. Ignore all the other ones, but these two or three or four that really bother you, loudly and repeatedly keep denouncing them. That's really all you mean. I have never once encountered somebody that says, uh, you need to tell the truth like it is, tell like it is. Wh what they really meant is I need to, every single time that I get on the stage, I need to get up there and say, if you're a homosexual, you're sinning. It's like, yes, we get it. Like, <laughs> it's in the Bible. I don't really feel like I need to recover that ground every single week. And uh, meanwhile, it's like there's a schism in the church. We're not really sure what to do. We know that people in the world are sinners. They need, they need God. They need to change. But then we forget this whole other part here that we Christians need, need God and we need to change. Just because we're in the door with salvation doesn't mean that we don't need to grow anymore. That's just Look at how many times in the Bible the harsh messages are actually for God's people and not the world. The grand majority of the prophets... Not all of them, but the grand majority of them. This is one of the things that irritated Jonah so badly. <laughs> uh, most of the New Testament epistles have to do with... In fact, Paul even says this. What business is it of mine to judge the world? God will judge the world. We judge the church. We judge ourselves. He actually says that in 1 Corinthians. So I, I think that if Paul said it, he probably meant it. Uh, but sometimes we get in a place where... Um, that's all we want to talk about is the sins of the world. Yes, we know that they're sinning. That's why they need God. Like, we don't need to criticize every single thing they're doing. We already know that they're sinning, right? We don't need to make better a better society that's going to hell. We need people to get saved. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, this guy got off of drugs, and this guy's not gay anymore. They're all going to hell anyways because they don't know Jesus, but at least we changed them. <laughs> like... <laughs> Come on, guys, that, 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 that doesn't fit. Um, and unfortunately, it's been the resounding anthem of the church for countless years. Um, <clears throat> so the world does as they are stuck on. It's just, that's just what the world does. They're stuck in sin. That's, that's why they, they can't help themselves. They can get off drugs, they can change the lifestyle, but they can't really save themselves. Um, but us, on the other hand, we have encountered the grace, and we have to keep encountering it in our lives. Because we do get crusty and nasty and mean and, and, and brood. Um, I, I already shared a couple weeks ago um, about how there was somebody who, who wanted people to tell it like it is. And so I, I told it, I, I, exact, exact same tone that he was using, exact same word and argument that I was using. I just flipped it back on him and he got very upset. And it, I remember I said that that was not the right thing to do. The friendship ended. It wasn't, I'm saying, don't do that. But, but I'm saying I talked to them in that same condescending tone that they were wanting to talk to sinners, and they got mad because, you know, well, well, I'm not like one of them. See what I mean? We forget. We forget where we came from. We forget Jesus. I was saved by grace, but now I'm, now I'm saved through works. Like it, it doesn't work like that. We're still, we're still needing that grace in our life. There was a church that I was driving past today, and it said on the sign, it said, where the word of God is still the word of God. And now I know exactly what that means. See what I mean? It's just harmless, it's a harmless sentence, but I already know exactly what that means, and I think you probably know exactly what that means too. Long story short, don't invite somebody to church if they're gay, because <laughs> that's all they're going to be talking about over there. <laughs> So in this series, we looked at dealing with conflict with a proper attitude and in the right way. Very important stuff. It's not just dealing with conflict. It's doing it right and with the right attitude. Um, and that's the end of, the, the end of this series.